Hello, Familia. So I'm really grateful to God that I am able to share with you all that God has given me um, today, especially since, you know, for the last however long I've, you know, been barely able, been barely able to sit up without feeling very sick. And so I'm just giving glory to God that um, while I still don't feel great, I feel well enough and I feel blessed enough to um, be able to receive his word and then be able to give it to you and share with you in the mighty name of Jesus and under his power and by his mercy and by his grace alone. Know. And so we'll start with prayer. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, I just thank you for another day to be able to share your word and your truth and and all that you are and i just thank you that your word is truth and that you are reliable that we can trust you thank you father god help us to trust you more every day may your name father god be kept holy revered honored loved and treasured as it should be Father God, may your kingdom come and may your will be done right here on earth as it is in heaven. Father God, we ask that that happen in all of our hearts and minds, spirits, souls, and bodies. In the mighty name of Jesus, let your will be done. Let your kingdom come right here on earth as it is in heaven. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you. I believe you are. Father God, give us this day our daily bread. And please, Lord, please forgive us our trespasses. And please, Father God, help us to repent from our sins and from our trespasses and our iniquities. And help us to turn to you, the perfecter and the initiator of our faith, in order to bring us home blameless and spotless for the day of your coming lord yeshua in the mighty name of jesus i pray father god please help us to forgive others their trespasses against us as well father god help us to let go help us to not carry around the bitterness and and any resentment or Help us to be rid of all of those things that we carry around, Father God, and just help us to truly forgive as you graciously and mercifully forgive us of our sins and trespasses and iniquities. Father God, I thank you that your son has bought us forgiveness. Lead us towards thy son and towards thy forgiveness and towards the life that is pure and true in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Father God, lead us away from all temptation. And please, Father God, deliver us from all evil. For thine is the kingdom, and thine is the power, and thine is the glory. Now, always, and forever, Father God, show us what that means. Show us how to truly live as if we believed that were true. Help us to not only believe the words that you say, Father God, but help us to live out the words that you say. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray, and I give you thanks that I believe you are, and that I believe you do every single day, and I thank you for your guidance and for your light that shines through all darkness. In the mighty name of Jesus, hallelujah and amen. Well, so today, um, you know, it kind of goes along with um, where I you know, left off last, you know, last time in regards to trusting God and, and trusting what he says and, um, all that. And, 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 you know, um, allowing the word of God to do what it does, you know, to do the work that it does within us and to truly teach us how to live and how to, love God with all of our being and to, to love others as we love ourselves. And one of the um, scriptures that really, you know, started this, today's whole, you know, line of scripture was in Romans 8, verse um, 31. 
And I continued through verse 34. It says, What then are we to say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare even his own son, but gave him up on behalf of us all, is it possible that, having given us his son, he would not also give us everything else too? So who will bring a charge against God's chosen people? Certainly not God. He is the one who causes them to be considered righteous. Who punishes them? Certainly not the Messiah Yeshua who died, and more than that has been raised, is at the right hand of God and is actually pleading on our behalf. And there was so much to just unpack in all those it's this few lines that I just was like, okay, well, it's true, you know, if, if God is for us, who can be against us? Absolutely nothing can be, right? Absolutely nothing. And he who did not spare his, even his own son, but gave him up on behalf of us all, is it possible that having given us his son, he would not also give us everything else too? That he wouldn't just do everything that he, and give us everything that he's promised? Glory be to God. And then, you know, who will bring a charge against us, against God's chosen people? And I love this. Certainly not God. He is the one who causes them to be considered righteous. So, to me, that's even more freedom. Not freedom to be, you know, more sinful, but to, to, to freedom to just live with God's words as our, our truth and as our purpose and as, you know, our being, you know, as how we live with Holy Spirit being the one guiding us, not the way we think or the way that we do things, but it being Holy Spirit that we truly don't have anything to, to fear, that we truly can be sinless and be without sin by the power of God, that we truly can be holy as he is holy, and that we truly can be perfect as he is perfect, because he says to be, you know, that was something that always got me, you know, like, okay, so wait, he says, be holy as he is holy, and then be perfect as he is perfect, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to do that, <laughs> but how, you know, it always came back to the how, because, you know, I would always do it by my own understanding, do it by my own thinking, and by the way the world thinks that, well, nobody's perfect, right? And nobody can be as holy as God is holy. Well, then why would God say, be holy as he is holy, be perfect as he is holy if we couldn't? Now, now I'm not saying, again, this is not something... I do on my own, or we do is on our own. This is all purely of God's making. And, you know, I said, okay, God, I believe this, and I understand it to the extent that you're allowing me to understand it. But how do I, you know, put that into words? How do I express that as, as truth, as something we can truly stand on even though we should just be able to just oh okay now I'm just gonna go live my life it's hard for us we you know and I, I believe that that's why he's given us his word in order to help us build on a strong foundation of his word and not our own ways and not our own thinking and so as I approached the rest of it I said okay well I'm gonna need your help because I I just you know, besides just telling it to you and saying, well, look, here's what it says. I didn't know how to, you know, go any further. And so I'm praying that by power of Holy Spirit that um, we'll all be led in that direction. In Romans chapter 3, um, it's verses 5 through 8 is what I wrote down. It says, now if our unrighteousness highlights God's righteousness, what should we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict his anger on us? I'm speaking here the way people commonly do. Heaven forbid. How, else how could God judge the world? Or how else could God judge the world? 
But you say, if through my lie, God's truth is enhanced and brings him greater glory, why am I still judged merely for being a sinner? Indeed, why not say, as some people slander us by claiming we do say, let us do evil so that good may come of it. Against them, the judgment is a just one. And so that's not, that's not to say that we're just free to do whatever we want. Because then, then we're not under the covenant. Then we're not under grace. You know, then we're not following the Spirit. We're not living by the Spirit as we're supposed to. Um, and so no one is good. And the way that we make people out to be good when they're not is a lie. Jesus himself, and I'm going to prove it to you, but by power of Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Um, I didn't write this one down, but I have um, the scriptures that, you know, says no one is good. But Jesus himself said, why are you calling me good? Meaning, why are you calling me Jesus good? No one is good but the Father. Jesus himself said he was not good. So who are we to say, oh, I'm a good person. You know, I, I go to church and, and I follow, you know, God's law. And, you know, I do all the things that he says. Can you say that? If Jesus can. And if Jesus wasn't even allowed to speak on his own or do anything of his own accord. He said he wasn't even able to do anything on his own. May that be so for all of us. In Psalm chapter 14, um, it says this. Um, I wrote down 1 through 3, but I think I'm just going to go ahead and read the whole thing. It says, The fool says in his heart, God does not exist. They are corrupt. They do vile deeds. There is no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the human race to see if there is one who is wise, one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Will evildoers never understand? They consume my people as they consume bread. They do not call on the Lord. Then they will be filled with terror, for God is with those who are righteous. You sinners frustrate the plans of the afflicted, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that Israel's deliverance would come from Zion when the Lord restores the fortunes of his people. Jacob will rejoice. Israel will be glad. Hallelujah. It says, let Israel be glad. And hallelujah, Father God, restore Zion to its rightful place. Psalm chapter 53, here's another one. It's also called the portrait of sinners. It says, the fool says in his heart, God does not exist. They are corrupt and they do vile deeds. There is no one who does good. God looks down from heaven on the human race to see if there is one who is wise, one who seeks God. All have turned away. All who alike have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Will evildoers never understand? They consume my people as they consume bread. They do not call on God. Then they will be filled with terror, terror like no other. Because God will scatter the bones of those who besiege you. You will put them to shame, for God has rejected them. Oh, that Israel's deliverance would come from Zion when God restores the fortunes of his people. Jacob will rejoice. Israel will be glad. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 20. Just in case there's still anything in our heart that says that's deceiving us saying that there's good in us apart from God or anything good apart from God 
<laughs> it's Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Forgive me, I always, it's a small chapter, so I always struggle to find it. Father God, help me find the book of Ecclesiastes. And he almost I was started to the right page, too. Glory be to God. It says, There is certainly no righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. It says, Don't pay attention to everything people say, or you may hear your servant cursing you, for you know that many times you yourself have cursed others. And so, you know, there's, there's no one who does good and does not sin. Um... We cannot boast of ourselves um, before God. We can. We can boast of, you know, all the good works that we do. And, oh, you know, that, you know, oh, I know God. And, you know, um, I know the way he speaks. And, you know. But what are we basing that off of? Is it based off God's wisdom? In Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through, here, which I did write down, 1 through 5, it says this. It says, then what should we say? Abraham, our forefather, obtained by his own efforts. For if Abraham came to be considered righteous by God because of legalistic observances, then he has something to boast about. But this is not how it is before God. It's not. For what does the Tanakh say? Abraham put his trust in God and it was credited to his account as righteousness. Now the account of someone who is worthy or who is working is credited not on the ground of grace, but on the gr ground of what is owed him. That is such a profound line. Now, the account of someone who is working is credited not on the ground of grace, but on the ground of what is owed him. Are we working to be owed something? Because that's not how it works either. Because, however, in the case of one who is not working, but rather is trusting in him who makes ungodly people righteous, his trust is credited to him as righteousness. Excuse me. So it's not in the case of, you know, the one who is not working, but rather is trusting in him to make God, you know, ungodly people righteous. We're counting on him being our righteousness, him being, you know, what is changing us. And it's his grace. And not our deeds and not our good works and not us following the law. Because if that is where we're getting our righteousness from, well, then you better start following every single 613 of them. Because he says if we fail at one single rule of the law, and the law and the prophets, we fail at just one. We're guilty of all of them. And we all have, and you know, what greater grace is it than for our God to be like, okay, we break one, they're guilty of all, and there's nothing that they can do to help themselves, so I'm going to just go ahead and give him my son, and, and he's going to be the atonement, and he's going to be their righteousness, and all they have to do is just believe that, and that's credited to them as righteousness. And them, you know, basing all their actions based on that faith and based on that righteousness and based on the word of God given to us, 
by trusting that it's true, that is credited to us as righteousness. Um, in um, Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 11, it says, But the things that used to be advantages for me, I have, because of the Messiah, come to consider as a disadvantage in comparison with the supreme value of knowing the Messiah Yeshua as my Lord. It was because of him that I gave up everything and regarded it all as garbage in order to gain the Messiah and be found in union with him, not having any righteousness of my own based on legalism, but having that righteousness from God based on trust. Yes, I gave it all up in order to know him, that is, to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, as I am being conformed to his death, so that somehow I might arrive at being resurrected from the dead. Hallelujah and amen. I love that. And I love that, you know, he says, I... Gave it all up in order to know him. That is to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings because he learned obedience through his sufferings. And so that is how we learn our obedience is through our sufferings. Um, I'm going to read this chapter as well in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Um, but I wrote down verses 30 and 31. It says, It is his doing that you are united with the Messiah, Yeshua. He has become wisdom for us from God and righteousness and holiness and redemption as well. Therefore, as the Tanakh says, let anyone who wants to boast, boast about Adonai. We have everything to brag about in God. So if you got lots to boast about, you know... Um, and, and, you know, you got lots to talk about. Jesus can give you even more, you know, to boast about in him. Um, he's so beautiful, you guys. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it says this. It says, Paul called an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will. And so then he's our brother to God's church at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus and called as saints with all those in every place who call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and shalom from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of God's grace given to you in Christ Jesus, that by him you were enriched in everything, in all speech, in all knowledge, and this way the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end, so that you will be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. You were called by him into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. It says, now I urge you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree in what you say, that there be no divisions among you, and that you be united with the same understanding and the same conviction, familia. We must not have these divisions between us, and so may the Lord help us to stop <laughs> and to join together in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Because we can't, we can talk, we can say it, you know, I can say all day long, a house divided against itself cannot stand, and there will be still 50,000 denominations of Christianity that are not true. There's still going to be, it's still got to be God. He's still got to do the thing, and I believe he will. Uh, continuing in um, verse 11, for it has been reported to me about you, my brothers, by members of Chloe's household, that there is rivalry among you. What I am saying is this. Each of you says, I'm with Paul, or I'm with Apollos, or I'm with Cephas, or I'm with Christ. 
Was Christ divided? Was it Paul who crucified was who was crucified for you? Or were you baptized in Paul's name? Thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say you were baptized in my name. I did, in fact, baptize the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know if I baptized anyone else, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to evangelize, not with clever words, so that the cross of Christ will not be emptied of its effect. Hallelujah and amen. Let it be so, Father God. For the message of the Christ, or for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But it is God's power to us who are being saved. Yes and amen it is. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will set aside the understanding of the experts. That's in Isaiah chapter 29, 14. Where is the philosopher? Where is the scholar? Where is the debater of this age? Hasn't God made the world's wisdom foolish? For since in God's wisdom the world did not know through wisdom, God was pleased to save those who believe through the foolishness of the message preached. Who believed through the foolishness of the message preached. I love it. For the Jews ask for signs and the Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. Yet to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is God's power and God's wisdom. Because God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Brothers, consider your calling. Not many are wise from human perspective. Not many are powerful. Not many of noble birth. Instead, God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. He's not lying. This is so true. Thank you for choosing the weak, Father God, and the foolish. God has chosen what is insignificant and despised in the world. What is viewed as nothing to bring to nothing what is viewed as something so that no one can boast in his presence. But it is from him that you are in Christ Jesus, who became God-given wisdom for us, our righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, in order that, as it is written, the one who boasts must boast in the Lord. And I love that. I love this. It's so true. And that's in Jeremiah 9, 20, uh, four, which I actually am going to next. Um, and so I just am really grateful because, um, this message was foolishness to me as well, because I didn't understand it. And I was looking in all the wrong places in order to understand it. We're not going to find God in man-made buildings, and we're not going to find God in ways that man is going to teach us. We're going you know, to find who God really is from God himself. And, and that's a good thing. This is a, you know, that's a good thing that it comes from God because we don't want it to be able to boast in themselves because otherwise then what would be the purpose of the cross? He wouldn't have had to die if we could do it ourselves. Um, in Jeremiah chapter 29, I wrote down 22 through 24. Here it says this. Here is what Adonai says. The wise man should not boast of his wisdom. The powerful should not boast of his power. The wealthy should not boast of his wealth. Instead, let the boaster boast about this. That he understands and knows me, meaning knows God. That I am Adonai, practicing grace, justice, and righteousness in the land. For in these things I take pleasure, says Adonai. 
The days are coming, says Adonai, when I will punish all those who have been circumcised in their uncircumcision. And he, he's going to clarify that in 25 and 26. It says, Egypt, Judah, or Judah, Edom, and the people of Ammon and Moab, and all those living in the desert who cut the edges of their beard. For although all the Goyim are uncircumcised, all the house of Israel have uncircumcised hearts. And I looked up, cut the edges, you know, just kind of get a little bit more in depth. Meaning, um, it was it was basically, you know, to keep the Israelites from following or imitating the practices of paganism. It was to set them apart. Um, and it also, you know, was a way of guarding ourselves, our hearts from idols or from copying other humans, um, which led to, you know, be holy because the Lord your God is holy. That's in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 1. It says this, Adonai said to Moshe, speak to the entire community of Israel. Tell them, you people are to be holy because I, Adonai, your God, am holy. Isn't say any other reason other than he is and if he's our god then we must be set apart we must be holy as he is holy um and first peter chapter 1 verses 14 through 16 i actually ended up going through 21 and then i'll read the rest of that chapter in the text but i i wrote down as people who obey god do not let yourself be shaped by the evil desires you used to have when you were still ignorant. On the contrary, following the Holy One who called you, become holy yourselves in your entire way of life. Since the Tanakh says, you are to be holy because I am holy. Also, if you are addressing as Father the one who judges impartially according to each person's actions, you should live out your temporary stay on earth in fear. You should be aware that the ransom paid to free you from the worthless way of life which your fathers passed on to you did not consist of anything perishable like silver or gold. On the contrary, it was the costly sacrificial death of the Messiah as of a lamb without defect or spot. God knew him before the founding of the universe, but revealed him in the Acharit Hayanim for your sake. He was revealed in the world for our sakes. Through him, we trust. It says, through him, you trust in him. You trust in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your trust and hope are in God. It's not in people. It's not in the church that you go to. It's it's not even in your church community. It's not. And and if they're telling you that, it's a lie. It's a lie. You can't be saved outside of God. There's, there's no Jesus. I mean, then what was the work on the cross for? If you can answer me that. Then, then I'll give it to you. But you can't. You can't. Um, in First Peter, um, I'm going to start off where I left off as in verse 22. It says, by obedience to the truth, let's see, to the foreknown, it says, having purified yourselves, through the Spirit, for a sincere love of the brothers, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of per perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring Word of God. And, and notice what it says, through the living and enduring Word of God. This is why man cannot live on bread alone, but Every word that proceeded from the mouth of God it says, For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like a flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. This is the word that was preached as the gospel to you. 
And that is in, that scripture, by the way, is in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 6 through 8. Uh, this word can't pass away and so if that is what we are feeding ourselves off and, and off of and we're living off of that off the word of God by power of Holy Spirit we don't have to worry about all the things that the world is worrying about um, glory be to God we don't in Romans back to Romans chapter 4 we started at the beginning of that in 23 and 24 it says but the words it was credited to his account were not written for him only they were written also for us who will certainly have our account credited too because we have trusted in him who has raised Yeshua our Lord from the dead Yeshua who was delivered over to death because of our offenses and raised to life in order to make us righteous Glory be to God. It says in Romans 10, verses 8 through 13, it says, What then does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the word about trust, which we proclaim, namely, that if you acknowledge publicly with your mouth that Yeshua is Lord, and trust in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be delivered. You will be delivered. Forgive me, Smiley. I can breathe. <laughs> I'm still definitely not feeling um, very well physically. So, um, thanks be to God, His Word definitely is, you know, giving me life within me still. So, glory be to God. It says, um, continuing in verse 10 of that same chapter, it says, for, for with the heart, one goes on trusting and thus continues toward righteousness. While with the mouth, one keeps on making public acknowledgement and thus continues toward deliverance. For the passage quoted says that everyone who rests his trust on him will not be humiliated. That means there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. Adonai is the same for everyone, rich toward everyone who calls on him, since everyone who calls on the name of Adonai will be delivered. And I want to continue in the script um, to the end of the chapter. So Romans chapter 4. I'm just continuing in verse 4, or, yeah, verse 14. So those who are, well, I'll go ahead and just start in 13, because that's the beginning of this whole section. It says, for the promise to Abraham, or to his descendants, that he would inherit the world, was not through the law, but through the righteousness that comes from faith, or the righteousness of faith. If those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made empty and the promise is canceled. For the law produces wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. If there is no law, there is no transgression. And since we're under the law of grace, and we truly believe that, we can't. That's, that's how it works. We can't sin if there is no law against it. Hallelujah. This is why the promise is by faith, so that it may be according to grace, to guarantee it to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, or not to those who are of the law only, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of Abraham's faith. Here is the father of us all in God's sight, or he is the father of us all in God's sight. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. He believed in God who gives life to the dead and calls things into existence that do not exist. He believed, hoping against hope, 
so that he became the father of many nations, according to what had been spoken. So will your descendants be. He considered his own body to be already dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and also considered the deadness of Sarah's womb, without weakening in the faith. He did not waver in unbelief at God's promise, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, because he was fully convinced that what he had promised he was also able to perform. Therefore, it was credited to him for righteousness. Now it was credited it was credited to him was not written for Abraham alone, but also for us. It will be credited to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. And I love that. Um, not to those who have the law only. I'm trying to understand those lines where it says, this is why the promise is by faith, so that it may be according to grace. To guarantee it to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of Abraham's faith. I will trust Adonai to um, give us information on that. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1, I love um, what Paul says here. It says, from, he refers to himself as Shaul, though, um, by God's will, an emissary of the Messiah, Yeshua. And then he says, to God's people living in Ephesus, that is, those who are trusting in the Messiah, Yeshua. And in verse 3, he says, Praise be Adonai, Father of the Lord Yeshua, of our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, who in the Messiah has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heaven. We've already received it. He says we're seated up there in Ephesians 2, verse 6. Um, in 1 Timothy 4, verse 12, I'm going to read 13 through 16, which I believe is actually the end of the chapter as well. Um, but it says this, don't let anyone look down of you, on you because of your youth. On the contrary, set the believers an example in your speech, behavior, trust, and purity. Um, the, the best thing that I can say to you in regards to this, because I felt like I had to say something. So Spirit, help me, because I know it was you. Is that new believers, people in their youth, Christianity, are not necessarily less behind than those who are more mature. And the best way is to set an example. Don't correct. Don't say anything. That is my advice to you because he says <laughs> it too. Just set the believers as an example in your speech, behavior, trust, and purity. And then trust the Lord to do the rest. Just trust me. <laughs> because he says too. <laughs> Um, it's a continuing, it says, when you, oh, excuse me, I'm in, for, I'm in 2 Timothy, forgive me, I wrote 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4, and this is verse 13 through 16, it says, until I come, I'm going to actually start with verse 12 in this section, or verse 11, rather, in this section, it says, command and teach these things. Let no one despise your youth. Instead, you should be an example to the believers in speech and conduct and love and faith and purity. Until I come, give your attention to public reading, exhortation, and teaching. Do not neglect the gift that is in you. It was given to you through prophesy. 
with the laying on of hands by the council of elders. Practice these things. Be committed to them so that your progress may be evident to all. Pay close attention to your life and your teaching. Persevere in these things, for by doing this you will save both yourself and your hearers. I love that. That's, that's you know, where our truth comes from in our actions and in the way we live. Um, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 6, it says, The words of the wicked are a deadly ambush, but the speech of the upright rescues them. And so, you know, you can't, you know, with the words of the wicked be a deadly ambush to us either. We can still have the speech of the upright by power of Holy Spirit. And I believe, you know, by, if that's the will of God, that we can rescue them just by the you know, power of our words because we're speaking life and not death. Um, everything will be destroyed. Everything that we see will be destroyed. And so how we live truly does matter. In Second Peter chapter 3, I wrote down verses 11 through 18, but it says, but we'll see where I, where spirit leads me, where you want to start. Let's go ahead and start because it just talks about the day of the Lord. It says, Dear friends, this is now the second letter I have written to you. In both letters, I want to develop a genuine understanding with a reminder so that you can remember the words previously spoken by the holy prophets and the command of our Lord and Savior given through your apostles. First, be aware of this. Scoffers will come in the last days to scoff living according to their own desires, saying, where is the promise of his coming? Ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they have been since the beginning of creation. They willfully ignore this. Long ago, the heavens and the earth were brought about from water and through water by the word of God. Through these waters, the world of that time perished when it was flooded. But by the same word, the present heavens and earth are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Dear friends, don't let this one thing escape you. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all. To come to repentance. I do too. That's why I hope to keep preaching and, and speaking. Because I want that too. But the day but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day the heavens will pass away with a loud noise. The elements will burn and be dissolved. And the earth and the works on it will be disclosed. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, it is clear what sort of people you should be in holy conduct and godliness as you wait for and earnestly desire the coming of the day of God. The heavens will be on fire and dissolved because of it, and the elements will melt with the heat. But based on his promises, we wait for the new heavens and a new earth where righteousness will dwell. Therefore, dear friends, while you wait for these things, make every effort to be found at shalom with him without spot or blemish. Also regard the patience of our Lord as an opportunity for salvation, just as our dear brother Paul has written to you according to the wisdom given to him. He speaks about these things in all his letters in which there are some matters that are hard to understand. The untaught and unstable twist them to their own destruction, as they also do with the rest of the scriptures. Therefore, dear friends, since you know this in advance, be on your guard so that you are not led away by the error of lawless people and fall from your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Hallelujah and amen. 
may we all continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord, Savior, Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because that's really the only way. Um, and the other reason is, is because God is love. And we cannot love God with all of our heart and all of our understanding and all of our beings. And we cannot love our neighbor as ourself if we don't know love himself. God is love. And so we cannot say that we are truly being loving and loving God and loving others unless we know God. And... This is another reason why I believe he says that not all those who say, Lord, Lord, will see the kingdom of heaven. He says, he'll tell some people, depart from me. I never knew you. And I believe this is part of the reason is because they didn't, they had not love. First Corinthians chapter 13. If I speak human or angelic languages, do not have love. I am a sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift to prophesy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I donate all my goods to feed the poor, and if I give my body in order to boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Or we can give our body to be burned is another message translation. But do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It is not boastful. It is, is not conceited. Does not act improperly. Is not selfish. Is not provoked. And does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends, but as far as, as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for languages, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when, it, when the perfect comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put aside childish things. For now we see indistinctly as in a mirror, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully as I am fully known. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. It's the greatest command. That's why it is the greatest command. And we're to love each other. And part of the way we do that is we don't prejudge and we don't do anything out of favoritism. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, we will go to the text. And let's see, it was 20 through 22. It says, Public rebuke, publicly rebuke those who sin, so that the rest will be afraid. I solemnly charge you before God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels to observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing out of favoritism. Don't be too quick to appoint anyone as an elder, and don't share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Don't continue drinking only water, but use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent Ill illnesses. Some people's sins are obvious, going before them to judgment, but the sins of others surface later. Likewise, good works are obvious, and those that are not obvious cannot remain hidden. And I love that. Um, and, and I love, too, that God is trying to show us not, we can't judge and we can't prejudge anything. 
Um, and the reason is, is it says some people's sins are obvious, going before them to judgment. But the sins of others surface later or will follow later. Same with the good works are obvious. And those that are not obvious, obvious cannot remain hidden. Um, true religion, um, it says in verse 21 in 1 Timothy chapter 6, and I am going to read that as well. It says, for many who promised the knowledge, this knowledge have missed the mark as far as the faith is concerned. Grace be with you. Um, false doctrine and human greed starts in 2B. It says, teach and encourage these things. If anyone teaches other doctrine and does not agree with the sound teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the teaching that promotes godliness, he is conceited, understanding nothing, but has a sick interest in disputes and arguments over words. From these come envy, quarreling, slander, evil suspicions, and excuse me, constant disagreement among people, whose minds are depraved and deprived of the truth, who imagine that godliness, godliness is a way to material gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out but if we have food and clothing we will be content with these but those who want to be rich fall into a temptation a trap and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, and by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. But you, man of God, woman of God, run from these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, and faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight for the faith. Take hold of eternal life that you were called to and have made a good confession about in the presence of many witnesses. We're to pursue these things that come through God as well. We, When we are weak, he is strong. That's our endurance. He is gentle. That's how we are gentle. God is love. That has, that's how we can love. Faith is a fruit of the Spirit. Godliness also. Righteousness as well. And, you know, we're to fight the good fight for our faith. Our faith, the one that's inside of us, um, that's important to fight, fight for just as much as it is speaking it, um, for sure. Um, we're taking a hold of eternal life. We're not, no more taking hold of this life. This life is dying. It's fading away from us. We cannot cling to the things of this world and cling to Jesus. We just, we cannot. It's got to be one or the other. We cannot serve money and we cannot serve God at the same time. And it even says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Um, continuing in verse 13, it says, In the presence of God who gives life to all, and of Christ Jesus, who gave a good confession before Pontius Pilate, I charge you to keep the command without fault or failure until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. God will bring this about in his own time. He is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the only one who has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light. No one has seen or can see him. To him be honor and eternal might. Hallelujah and amen. Instruct those who are rich in the present age not to be arrogant or to set their hope on the uncertainty of wealth, but on God, who richly provides us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do what is good, to be rich in good works, to be generous, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good reserve for the age to come so that they may take hold of a life that is real. That's how we take hold of a life that is real. I did two videos on those too as well that were so good. 
Thank you, Jesus. All glory goes to him. Um, to be rich and to do what is good, rich in good works, to be generous, willing to share, storing up for ourselves a good reserve for the age to come. And that's how we take hold of a life that's real. Um, and this is just a little final exhortation to Timothy from Paul. It says, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you, avoiding your reverent empty speech and contradictions from the knowledge that falsely bears that name. By, prof by professing it, some people have de deviated from the faith. Grace be with all of you. And that's our church right now. We are just stuck in this communication pitfall of, you know, irreverent, empty speech and contradictions from the knowledge that falsely bears that name. That is our church right now. 100%. That is why there's 50,000 denominations. And that's why we can't agree. Because it's not under one spirit. They're under one name. Messiah Yeshua. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11, um, I have through 13, and then I'll read 14 through 26. It says, here's a statement you can trust. If we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we persevere, we will also rule with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. And so I am going to go ahead and read the rest of that, 14 through 2 Timothy 2. these things, charging them before God, not to fight about words. This is in no way profitable and leads to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, correctly teaching the word of truth. But avoid irreverent, empty speech, for this will produce an even greater measure of godlessness. And their word will spread like gangrene. Hermenius and Philetus are among them. They have deviated from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place and are overturning the faith of son, some. Nevertheless, God's solid, founda God solid foundation stands firm. Having this inscription, the Lord knows who are his, and everyone who names the name of the Lord must turn away. From unrighteousness. It's in Numbers 16, chapter, Numbers 16, 5. The Lord knows who is his. It says, now in large, in a large house, now in a large house, there are not only gold and silver bowls, but also those of wood and clay. Some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. So if anyone purifies himself from anything dishonorable, he will be a special instrument set apart, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Flee from youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and shalom, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart, but reject foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they breed quarrels. The Lord's slave must not quarrel, but must be gentle to everyone, able to teach and patient instructing his his opponents with gentleness perhaps god will grant them repentance leading them to the knowledge of the truth then they may come to their senses and escape the devil's trap having been captured by him to do his will so it's the lord's you know it's not on us to you know we can gently correct and gently you know lead and show people the right way but God's got to be the one to do the thing incorrect. Um, in John chapter 8, verse 51, Jesus says, Yes, indeed, I tell you that whoever obeys my teaching will never see death. 
And so I thought, well, let's go into that a little bit more as well, because that's part of, you know, the immortality and the righteousness and all that. Um, John chapter 14, 23 and 24, it says, Yeshua answered him. If someone loves me, he will keep my word. My father will love him and we will come to him and make our home in him or home with him. Someone who doesn't love me doesn't keep my words. And the word you are hearing is not my own, but that of my Father who sent me. And I love that. Even Jesus couldn't speak his own words. He had to speak the Father's words as well. John chapter 15, verse 20, it says, Remember what I told you. A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you too. If they kept my word, they will keep yours too. John chapter 17, verse 6, I made your name known to the people you gave me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. That's Jesus' prayer to the Father. John chapter 18, verse 32, it says, This was so that what Yeshua had said about how he was going to die might be fulfilled. 1 John chapter 2, 5 and 6, it says this, But if someone keeps doing what he says, then truly love for God has been brought to its goal in him. This is how we are sure that we are united with him. And a person who claims to be continuing in union with him ought to conduct his life the way he did. So are we conducting the way he, he did? You know, are we living for him and preaching the words of God and spending our life giving and, and you know, counting all our trials with joy and, and being obedient to the Father in all things? In Revelations chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Blessed are the reader and hearers of the words of this prophesied, provided they obey the things written in it, for the time is near, provided that we obey. Revelations chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, it says, I know what you are doing. Look, I put in front of you an open door, and no one can shut it. I know that you have but little power, yet you have obeyed my message and have not disowned me. He knows we're weak. He knows the flesh is weak. <laughs> he knows that the ones that he chose are the foolish and the weak. And yet, we it says, you have obeyed my message and have not disowned me. I love that. Like, I know, I know. But, but you know, but you still obeyed. It says here, I will give you some from the synagogue of the adversary, those who call themselves Jews, but aren't. On the contrary, they are lying. See, I will cause them to come and prostrate themselves at your feet, and they will know that I have loved you. Because you did obey my message about persevering. I will keep you from the time of trial coming upon the whole world to put people, put the people living on the earth to the test. Um, I didn't write down 11 through 13, but I wrote down to read them. So I will go ahead and follow that. <laughs> um, Revelations 3, so verses 13, 11 through 13. says, I am coming quickly. Hold on to what you have so that no one takes your crown. The victor, I will make him a pillar in the sanctuary of my God, and he will never go out again. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. 
Anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. It says, verse 10, I'm just going to go ahead and repeat it again. It says, because you have kept my command to endure, I will also keep you from the hour of testing that is going to come over the whole world to test those who live on earth. I am coming quickly. Hold on to what you have so that no one takes your crown. The victor, I will make him a pillar in the sanctuary of my God, and he will never go out again. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down, of, down out of heaven from my God and my new name. Anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. And that's us. If we're claiming to be a follower of Jesus, then we need to be listening to what he says. Um, Revelations chapter 22, verses 7 through 9. And actually, um, I wrote for, through the whole chapter, but I'm going to read the for, for a few verses I wrote down in the Jewish translation first. It says, look, I'm coming very soon. Blessed is the person who obeys the words of prophesy written in this book. Then I... Yohanan, or John, the one hearing and seeing these things, when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel, showing them to me. But he said to me, Don't do that. I am only a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets and the people who obey the words in this book. Worship God. We're not going to get our salvation from anyone but God. Um, so we're going to start back up in verse 10. He also said to me, don't seal the prophetic words of this book because the time is near. Let the unrighteous go on in unrighteousness. Let the filthy go on being made filthy. Let the righteous go on in righteousness and let the holy go on being made holy. Look, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to repay each person according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the city gates. Outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices lying. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to attest these things to you. For the churches, I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright morning star. Both the spirit and the bride say, come. Anyone who hears should say, come. And the one who is thirsty should come. Whoever desires should take the living water as a gift. I testify to everyone who hears the prophetic words of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to them the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away the words of this prophetic book, God will take away his share of the tree of life and the holy city written in this book. He who testifies about these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all the saints. Amen. Hallelujah and amen. Um, so that's the end of the, the book, actually. Um, in Luke chapter 8 verse 13 it says the ones on the rock are those who when they hear the word accept it with joy but these have no root they go on trusting for a while but when a time of testing comes they apostatize or that and what that means is to abandon one's faith belief or allegiance abandon a previous loyalty or defection stray fall away from or to sell out um, in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, it says, Therefore, as the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, says, Today, if you hear God's voice, don't harden your hearts, as you did in the bitter quarrel on the day in the wilderness when you put God to the test. So, when we daily hear the word of God, and we're daily not hardening, the, hardening our hearts, but letting him soften it and we're hearing it we won't be like that um in first peter because that's by the grace of god though it's not anything we do i gotta make that clear 
First Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 13, it says, Dear friends, don't regard as strange the fiery, or fiery ordeal. I'm going to try this again by the name of Jesus. Dear friends, don't regard as strange the fiery ordeal occurring among you to test you as if something extraordinary were happening to you. Rather, to the extent that you share the fellowship of the Messiah's sufferings, rejoice so that you will rejoice even more when his glory is revealed. Consider it the suffering and the pain that you go through. Consider it as sharing in his sufferings and rejoice in them. I do. I praise God for this recent illness and I praise God that my stomach is still just an absolute wreck right now. I do. Because if I could even just scrape the surface of what he suffered for me in order to come to life again in, in his name and in his honor, it's mind blowing to me that I even get to do that. That he's even counted me worthy to share in his sufferings. You know, because his suffering was to create righteousness. You know, my suffering in and itself, you know, just by itself, doesn't do anybody any good. <laughs> Not even me. It does me no good to suffer just to suffer, right? And it does you no good just to suffer just to suffer. So I just really just praise the Lord for him giving, not just me, but us all is just right now in that moment, like an extra, like here's one more layer to that foundation that we're building on, right? That when fiery ordeals come through and, and can't even keep down water, <laughs> for instance, I'm just using my life as an example. How can I use yours? I can't. I can use mine. I love that, though, that, you know, I can count it, it not strange and not extraordinary, not punishment, but rather as part of getting to share in what Jesus suffered for us all. So that I will even further rejoice when his glory comes. Glory be to God. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Revolution, Revelations chapter 6 verse 10 says, um, these are, um, it's in verse 10 it starts out with, you know, they cry out in a loud voice. And these were the people who were put to death. For proclaiming the word and remember you know no one's greater than their master so let's remember that revelation 6 verse 10 and 11 says this they cried out in a loud voice sovereign ruler hakadesh the true one how long will it be before you judge the people living on earth and avenge our blood each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants should be reached, of their brothers who would be killed just as they had been. So, it's a little bit longer. Revelations 8, verse 13, Then I looked and I heard a lone eagle give a loud cry as it flew in mid-heaven. Whoa, whoa! Woe to the people living on earth because of the remaining blast from the three angels who have yet to sound their shafars. Revelation 13, verse 8. Everyone living on earth will worship it, the beast, except those whose names are written in the book of life belonging to the lamb slaughtered before the world was founded. If anyone is meant for captivity, into captivity he goes. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword he is to be killed. This is when God's holy people must persevere and trust. We must persevere and we must just trust in what he says. In verse 14, it says, It deceives the people living on earth by the miracles it is allowed to perform 
in the presence of the beast, and it tells them to make an image honoring the beast that was struck by the sword, but came alive again. The anti-Messiah. The ones not preaching the true Messiah. The anti-Messiah. Revelation 17, 8. The beast you saw once was, now is not, and will come up from the abyss. But it is on its way to destruction. The people living on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life since the foundation or since the founding of the world will be astounded to see the beast that once was, now is not, but is to appear. This calls for a mind of wisdom. Those of us that see it, it's not astounding. Jesus told us. He told us there's going to be false prophets. He told us there was going to be false apostles. There was going to be people apostatizing and falling away from the faith. He also said that the love of many will grow cold. He told us this. Verse 17 it says, for God put it in their hearts to do what will fulfill his purpose. That is to be of one mind and give their kingdom to the beast until God's words have accomplished their intent. Notice it's, they're giving their kingdom to the beast rather than to God. Notice, that, notice what he says. God put it in their hearts to do what will fulfill his purpose. Says that is to be of one mind and give their kingdom to the beast until God's words have accomplished their intent. Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, um, Joseph affirms this. You know, by the word of God, obviously. It's still the word of God. It's just we were blessed to have him speak through a man like us, named Joseph. It says, You meant to do me harm, but God meant it for good so that it would come about as it is today with many people's lives being saved. That's the whole point. That's why we can't go on our own understanding. We can't know who's written in the book of life and who's not without God. Jeremiah chapter 51 verse 12 says, and actually I kind of want to read that one, and that'll be it. That's actually the last scripture. Jeremiah 51, 12, raise a standard against the walls of Babel, of Babel, strengthen the guard, post the sentries, prepare ambushes, for Adonai has both planned and accomplished what he promised to do to those living in Babel. And, you know, um, Babel and Egypt are not the places we want to be, Amelia. We just don't. So, I'll end with Jeremiah chapter 51. Unless, obviously, God has something else for me, but... And meaning for me, what I mean by that is to say... Um, so, it says this. This is what... The Lord says, I am about to stir up a destructive wind against Babylon and against the population of Leba Komai. I will send strangers to Babylon who will scatter her and strip her land bare, for they will come against her from every side in the day of disaster. Don't let the archer string his bow. Don't let him put on his armor. Don't spare her, young men. Completely destroy her entire army. Those who were slain will fall in the land of the Chaldeans. Those who were pierced through in her streets. For Israel and Judah are not left widowed by their God, the Lord of hosts. Though their land is full of guilt against the Holy One of Israel. Leave Babylon. Save your lives, each of you. Don't perish because of her guilt. For this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. 
He will pay her what she deserves. Babylon was a gold cup in the Lord's, Lord's hand, making the whole earth drunk. The nations drank her wine, therefore the nations go mad. Suddenly Babylon fell and was shattered. Wail for her, get balm for her wound, perhaps she can be healed. We tried to heal Babylon, but she could not be healed. Abandon her, let each of us go to his own land, for her judgment extends to the sky and reaches as far as the clouds. The Lord has brought about our vindication. Come! Let's tell in Zion what the Lord our God has accomplished. Sharpen the arrows, fill the quivers. The Lord has put it into the mind of the king of the Medes, because his plan is aimed at Babylon to destroy her. For it is the Lord's vengeance, vengeance for his temple. Raise up a signal flag against the walls of Babylon. Fortify the watch post, set the watchmen in place. Prepare the ambush, for the Lord has both planned and accomplished what he has threatened against those who live in Babylon. And you who reside by many waters, rich in treasures, your end has come. Your life thread is cut. The Lord of hosts has sworn by himself, I will lift, I will fill you up rather. I will fill you up with men as with locusts. And they will sing the victory song over you. He made the earth by his power, established the world by his wisdom, and spread out the heavens by his understanding. When he thunders, the waters and the heavens are in turmoil, and he causes the clouds to rise from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain and brings the wind from his storehouses. Everyone is stupid and ignorant. Every goldsmith is put to shame by his carved image. For his cast images are a lie. There is no breath in them. They are worthless, a work to be mocked. At the time of their punishment, they will be destroyed. Jacob's portion is not like these, because he is the one who formed all things. Israel is the tribe of his inheritance. Yahweh of hosts is his name. You are my battle club, my weapons of war. With you I will smash nations. With you I will bring kingdoms to ruin. With you I will smash the horse and its rider. With you I will smash the chariot and its rider. With you I will smash man and woman. With you I will smash the old man and the youth. And with you I will smash the young man and the young woman. With you I will smash the shepherd and his flock. With you I will smash the farmer and his ox team. With you I will smash governors and officials. Love it. Jacob's portion. Which is the Lord. <laughs> I love that. I will repay Babylon and all the residents of Chaldea for all their evil they have done in Zion. Before your very eyes, this is the Lord's declaration. Look, I am against you, devastating mountains. This is the Lord's declaration. You devastate the whole earth. I will stretch out my hand against you, roll down from the cliffs, and turn you into a charred mountain. No one will be able to retrieve a cornerstone or a foundation stone from you because you will become desolate forever. This is the Lord's declaration. May it be so, Lord. Jesus, you're our cornerstone. Raise a signal flag in the land. Blow a ram's horn among the nations and set apart the nations against her. Summon kingdoms against her, Ararat, Mini, and Ashkenaz. Appoint a marshal against her. Bring up horses like a swarm of locusts. Set apart the nations for battle against her, the kings of Medea, her governors, and all her officials. In all the lands where they rule, the earth quakes and trembles because the Lord's intentions against Babylon stand to make the land of Babylon an uninhabited desolation. Babylon's warriors have stopped fighting. They sit in their strongholds. Their might is exhausted. They have become like women. Babylon's homes have been set ablaze. Her gate bars are shattered. Messenger races to meet messenger and herald to meet herald to announce the, to the king of Babylon that his city has been captured from end to end. The fords have been seized. The marshes set on fire and the soldiers are terrified. For this is what the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, says. 
and daughter Babylon is like a threshing floor. The time it is trampled. In just a little while, her harvest time will come. Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon has devoured me. He has crushed me. He has set me aside like an empty dish. He has swallowed me like a sea monster. He filled his belly with my delicacies. He has vomited me out. He has rinsed me off, is what it says. In a literal translation. Says the inhabitant of Zion. Let the violence be. Let the violence done to me and my family be done to Babylon. Let my blood be on the inhabitants of Chaldea, says Jerusalem. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. I am about to plead your case and take vengeance on your behalf. I will dry up her sea and make her fountain run dry. Babylon will become like a heap of rubble, a jackal's den, a desolation, and an object of scorn without inhabitants. They will roar together like young lions. They will growl like lion cubs. For well, they are flushed with heat. I will serve them a feast and I will make them drunk so that they revel, so that they pass out. Then they will fall asleep forever and never wake up. This is the Lord's declaration. I will bring them down like lambs to the slaughter, like rams together with male goats. How Shashash, Shashach has been capped. Captured, the praise of the whole earth seized. What a horror Babylon has become among the nations. The sea has risen over Babylon. She is covered with its turbulent waves. Her cities have become a desolation, a dry and arid land, a land where no one lives, where no human being passes through. I will punish Bel in Babylon. I will make him vomit what he swallowed. The nations will no longer stream to him. Even Babylon's wall will fall. Come out from among her, my people. Save your lives, each of you, from the Lord's burning anger. May you not become cowardly and fearful when the report is proclaimed in the land, for the report will come one year, and then another the next year. There will be violence in the land with ruler against ruler, Therefore, look, the days are coming when I will punish Babylon's carved images. Her entire land will suffer shame, and all her slain will lie fallen within her. Heaven and earth and everything in them will shout for joy over Babylon, because the destroyers from the north will come against her. This is the Lord's declaration. Hallelujah. I don't know about y'all, but I'm excited for Babylon's fall, that's for sure. Babylon must fall because of the slain of Israel. Even as the slain of all the earth fell because of Babylon, you who have escaped the sword, go and do not stand still. Remember the Lord from far away and let Jerusalem come to your mind. We are ashamed because we have heard insults. Humiliation covers our faces because foreigners have entered the holy places of the Lord's temple. Therefore, look, the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration when I will punish her carved images and the wounded will groan throughout her land, even if Babylon should ascend to the heavens and fortify her tall fortresses, destroyers will come against her from me. This is the Lord's declaration. The sound of a cry from Babylon, the sound of a great destruction from the land of the Chaldeans. For the Lord is going to devastate Babylon. He will silence her mighty voice. Their waves roar like abundant waters. The tumult to their voice resounds for a destroyer is coming against her, against Babylon. Her warriors will be captured, their bows shattered, for the Lord is a God of retribution. He will certainly repay. I will make her princes and sages drunk, along with her governors, officials, and warriors. And they will fall asleep forever and never wake up. This is the king's declaration. Yahweh of hosts is his name. This is what the what Yahweh of hosts says. Babylon's thick walls will be totally demolished. And her gates consumed by fire. The people will have labored for nothing. The nations will exhaust themselves only to feed the fire. Oh my gosh. That's what he says too. Jesus says it too in the New Testament. Like a whole bunch of times he says it. 
This is that exact same thing. It'll just be burned up in the fire. And count for nothing. It says, this is what Jeremiah the prophet commanded. Sariah, son of Neriah, son of Messiah, Messiah, the quartermaster, when he went to Babylon to king, with King Zedekiah of Judah in the fourth year of Zedekiah's reign. Jeremiah wrote on one scroll about all the disaster that would come to Babylon. All these words were written against Babylon. Jeremiah told Sariah, when you get to when you get to Babylon, see that you read all these words aloud. You must say, Lord, you have threatened to cut off this place so that no one will live in it, man or beast. Indeed, it will remain desolate forever. When you have finished reading the scroll, tie a stone to it to throw it in the middle of the Euphrates River. Then say, in the same way, Babylon will sink and never rise again. Because of the disaster I am bringing to on her, they will grow weary. The words of Jeremiah end here. And so that is also where I will end. And I just pray um, that the mighty of the Lord just blesses us to know more of his truth and to build more on his foundation of truth every single day with the most sincere heart. And may we all grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord, Messiah, Yeshua, more and more every single day in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. And I believe. Hallelujah and amen.